Hello and welcome to episode 69 of The Witcher chapter by chapter book review where I'll go through a summary of the latest chapter and give my detailed thoughts on it. Today I'm discussing the final chapter from Season of Storms chapter 20 and the epilogue. And this is my last episode. <laughs> this is the last one, at least as far as the Witcher book review is concerned. We'll pick this back up at some point in the future with a different series, but there will be no more of these because there are no more chapters. I could always do, I know there's like the, I think it's something ends, something begins um, story that I know is not canon. Um, I think it's like Geralt and Yen's wedding. I uh, never read it, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do it because it's not canon. I don't, I just, I don't know. Like, it just doesn't feel right to put that in here. I could just read that for pleasure someday. But so uh, with that, uh, thank you so much for joining my last ever episode of this uh, review of the Witcher books. It has been a lot of fun. It's been really great. And the support that I've received is it's unbelievable that I that anybody listens to this, and I, I don't mean to um, undermine myself. I'm just I remember when I decided to start doing this, I doubted it so many times. I kept thinking, is anybody really going to listen to this? Does like does anybody actually care to listen to some nobody who really doesn't even like know that much about literature? Is definitely not a literature expert. Uh, and analyze a series of books, but um, I know that a lot of people have come to me and told me that they do enjoy this and have expressed gratitude, and I'm, I'm so much more grateful for you listening. Um, well, not that it's a contest, but <laughs> this is how it usually goes. I go off my notes, and then I just I can't keep my thoughts straight, but I am especially overwhelmed today um, because this is the last episode. Um, also, really quick, it is not lost on me that my final episode reviewing these books is ending on number 69. I'll just say that and then move past it. But anyway, uh, I, I was very doubtful. I remember when I went to go record the first episode, I was feeling like, this is stupid. Nobody's going to want to listen to this. Like, why am I wasting my time? And then I thought, you know what? I'll just upload it. And if nobody cares to listen to it, then oh well. At least, like, I'm doing it for myself. And it's something I can do that I enjoy and really delve deep into this series that I really love. So why not? I guess uh, if nobody even cares about it, then I'm still getting something out of it for myself. But, yeah, I have gotten love and support that I really never anticipated (laughs) would come my way for this. So for that... Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to just go right into the discussion now. I'm not going to continue talking about this anymore um, because I feel like everybody just does that like on YouTube, on a podcast. And I don't know, I'm sure you're sick of it by now. Like with all of the people that do that, they just go into this long discussion about thanking people. But I don't want you to think I don't appreciate you. I want to, I want to make sure you know that I do because I do. Moving on, we're going to start with the recap from the previous episode. We have a very brief recap here, and then we'll summarize the final chapter and the epilogue, and then we'll talk about it in very fine detail, as I always do. So, for the recap, a disastrous storm sweeps over Karak, leaving many dead, and Geralt without a sword again. He, Dandelion, and Mosaic decide to leave Karak, but Mosaic, at some point between then and the next 12 days, makes her way back to Coral. Summary of Chapter 20 and the Epilogue While traveling, Geralt and Dandelion stop at an inn where Geralt is threatened by another witcher, known as Brienne, or the Cat of Yellow. Bran believes Geralt is on his way to Vizima to claim the job and subsequent reward offered by King Fultest, a job that Bran is set on claiming. He threatens Geralt to a fight to which Geralt refuses. Bran only backs down when a woman in the inn presents Geralt with his swords that were stolen. Finally! Geralt thanks the woman, who he learns is called Tiziana Frevy, and was sent to secretly deliver his swords by Yennefer. 
the secret didn't work out. <laughs> After spending the night with Tiziana, Geralt and Dandelion continue their journey when or where Geralt comes face to face with the Aguara who told him she'd return for him. She shows him that her child wasn't in fact killed, but was pretending to be dead back on the Prophet Labiota. Then, as a reward to Geralt, the Aguara metamorphoses herself into Yennefer. After the illusion passes, Geralt and Dandelion continue on their way. In the epilogue, we return to Nimue, who is still on the road to Aratuza. While traveling through the forest, she's almost attacked by a monster, but is saved by a stranger. The stranger matches Geralt's identity, and she tells him she thinks he's Geralt, even though it's 105 years past his death. He tells her about the Somne, Som, Som sign, the one that puts you to sleep that we learn about in this book. <laughs> I'm just going to say it's pronounced Som. He tells her about the Som sign, and then the next thing she knows, she's awoken by another traveler. The traveler welcomes her onto her wagon, and Nimue tells the woman she had a very strange dream. And that is how the book ends. So, to begin the discussion, we'll take it from the top of chapter 20, where we begin the chapter. It's the early morning, while Geralt and Dandelion are outside of the inn they just stayed at. They're getting ready to take off. And Dandelion notices Mosaic's horse, and he asks, oh, what about her? Why isn't she out here? Why isn't she coming along like she has been for the past few days? And Geralt tells him she's not riding with them anymore. So this shows us that it took place prior to the previous interlude, since in that interlude, Mosaic had already returned to Coral per Geralt's instruction. So we kind of see this moment through Geralt's perspective, although he doesn't offer much information on what exactly made him suddenly decide he wasn't going to have her as a part of his company any longer. Uh, and Dandelion actually even asks about this. He asks him, um, like, oh, what, what, why, like, do you know what you're doing? Why, why, why are you doing this? And Geralt just says that he doesn't want to talk about it. But I'm willing to bet it just took him a little bit of time to come to the understanding that if she doesn't return to Coral then her life long term is going to suck really bad. Like she previously told him, uh, she told him that suffering through an apprenticeship with Coral and Coral's harsh punishments is definitely better than any alternative option that she has. So the next scene, it's the end of the day and the two of them, Geralt and Dandelion, are dining at an inn called the Wild Boar and Stag. And there's plenty of other patrons present in the tavern. There's merchants, priestesses. Locals, there's a couple that Carol notices consists of a man who's way more interested in the woman than she is in him. And there's also a man by his lonesome in the corner covered by shadow. And the locals are starting to get a little bit intoxicated and they're beginning to accost the priestesses that are there at the inn. And Geralt, being good guy Geralt, wants to intervene on the, pri the priestess's behalves. But before he does anything, the individual in the corner confronts him by his name. And it's immediately apparent that he's a witcher. So there's two witchers in this tavern, something that we don't see happen very often. Uh, but it's apparent because he has the classic witcher eyes and he's wearing a medallion. But unlike Geralt's medallion, it isn't a wolf, but a cat. And the witcher asks Geralt if he's traveling to Vizima for the reward offered by King Foltest. And Geralt doesn't address this at all. He just points out that he knows that this man is Brahen, also known as the Cat of Yellow. And it was easy for him to identify this man because, as he says, there's very few of them, that, meaning the cats, that remain. So... Brahan says little to address this, and he goes right back to the topic of the reward in Vizima. And he's quite fixated on this reward uh, because he thinks Geralt is on his way to take the job, but Bran wants it badly. And he's so threatened by this that he challenges Geralt to a fight. And he introduces the possibility of a fight by saying that since Vesemir, we know who Vesemir is, passed sentence on him, Geralt has the opportunity now to carry out that sentence. And We've, of course, not heard anything about this passing of a sentence by Vesemir up to this point, um, or even anything about Vesemir passing sentence on anyone, so this immediately sounds strange. Uh, 
But Geralt refuses to fight him as he would well, he would like to avoid killing someone unless absolutely necessary. Plus, he doesn't even have a sword since he keeps losing his <laughs> throughout this whole story. But then, at that moment, Bran grabs one of the priestesses and holds his sword to her throat, threatening to kill not only her, but everyone in the inn, unless Geralt agrees to fight him. And then out of nowhere, the woman who was part of the couple sitting at the table gets up and places a package in front of Geralt. And he knows what it is before he even opens it. Well, probably because of the shape. Uh, I don't know what else would be in a sword-shaped package but a sword, but <laughs> it's his swords. So it's, uh, lo and behold, that he gets his swords back. And he first opens up the package and he's examining them and admiring them. And then... Um, He's admiring the silver sword that we learn has these runic signs on the blade, which translates to, I think it's probably um, runic, like, like a, probably originally in the dwarvish language, I would assume. Um, but it translates to, my gleam penetrates the darkness, my brightness disperses the gloom. It's like silver shines, creates kind of like a glare, but the silver sword also defeats darkness and evil. Uh, but anyway, the, the translation here, like those words that are on the blade kind of important and we're going to come back to that later so keep that in mind so then he tells Bran that he still won't fight him but if he harms that woman that he's threatening he's going to kill him like we're not going to fight i'm just going to kill you and i've got my swords now so i can do that no problem so at this Bran's confidence rapidly vanishes as a coward's does and he releases the woman and he says that since winter is coming and he cannot lodge and care more for the winter, he's in need of the reward offered by Full Test. And he keeps going on about this reward. He's so convinced that Geralt is also on his way to claim it, but Geralt never says a single thing about it. He doesn't confirm nor deny that he is going for that reward. Uh, but I guess Bran is pretty desperate. Uh, for the money like he said he can't go stay in Kaer Morhen for the winter he needs the funds to be able to not have to be a homeless vagabond during the winter months um, and I think that this position that he's in is probably one that he's gotten himself into when you consider his character traits and we don't learn a whole lot about him but this very brief meeting plus other things that we got a little bit of background information on throughout the book pretty much tells us that he, he's not a good guy. <laughs> so Geralt agrees with Bran that Kaer Morhen isn't for him. And Bran responds to that by calling Geralt and assumably the other witchers who stay there. He says, you're all hypocrites. You and all of them are hypocrites um, since you're just as much murderers as we are. We being the cats. Uh, which just isn't true. Um, but, you know, he's going to say whatever ridiculous thing he has to say, I guess. So as Bran's leaving, he's taken off now, Geralt says to him that it was a lie. Like, you you lied when you said that Vesemir passed sentence on you because witchers don't fight other witchers. And then he leaves him with a little threat. He says that if he finds out what happened in Yellow happens again, he'll make an exception to that rule of witchers not crossing blades with other witchers. And of course, we don't know the fine details of what happened in Yellow, but Dandelion later mentions that there was a massacre there. So I think we could assume that it was something terrible. He did something terrible. Um, but also, based on what we've heard about the cats, that's another thing we can assume. Um, and since we just met one of them, I do want to take a moment to talk about what we've heard, because they've been referenced multiple times throughout this book, but we've never been given direct information on them and even when we meet one like his past crimes are simply referenced so i want to talk about what we've heard since the lore although limited is interesting so the first time we heard about them it was in chapter nine harlan zara uses the cats as an argument against Geralt when Geralt's kind of being judgmental of sorcerers uh, so Geralt is meeting with um, Pinity and Harlan Zara uh, to talk about the energumen that he they wanted him to deal with, and or energumen whatever however it's pronounced, and um, Geralt and Zara don't get along very well. He doesn't really even get along with Pinity that well at this point, but better than Zara. But Zara says to him when Geralt's acting judgy, he says, "Am I to remind you?" of the psychopaths who wore medallions with a cat's head and who were also amused by the killing being wrought around them. 
So it sounds like it could be a bit fabricated considering who it was coming from and the purpose of bringing this up in the first place. But then we also hear from Shevlov, the former soldier who was harassing Temerians for Redania, who, albeit another unreliable source of information, but still makes a similar point to that of Zara, someone that he has nothing in common with, who he would never have crossed paths with. They do not run in the same circles. Uh, but Shevlov says... When serving in the army, I heard something quite different about witchers. They hire themselves out for everything, to spy, to guard, even to assassinate. They call themselves the cats. And then in chapter 17, the werewolf, the nice friend of Geralt's, his name is Otto Dusart, he says, I almost died of fear when I saw you with that silver blade. He's referencing the time where Geralt first was hired to deal with Otto. He said... I thought my last hour had come. There's no end of stories about witcher murderers relishing blood and torture. He doesn't say anything specifically about the cats, but I think at this point we've heard enough about them to be able to deduce that that's the cats that he has heard about, that like witchers in general are not like that. Geralt is certainly not like that. The other witchers that we've met previously in this series, we know that they wouldn't be relishing blood and torture. So... Uh, is probably the cats that he's heard of. So, um, also, not to mention right after Bran's departure from the scene, uh, Dandelion refers to the cats as failures, unsuccessful mutations, and that the name cats came from the similarities they share with cats, like aggression, cruelty, and impulsivity. So, that gives us a lot of background on these cats that we were so we were ready to understand what this guy was about when we meet him if (laughs) the way he behaves doesn't tell you enough so far and wide people have heard of these witchers that call themselves cats and they know them only for these terrible crimes and something that i think is really interesting about this it's been like peppered in throughout the series that the general public tends to think pretty lowly of witchers. There are some people that meet Geralt and they're very kind to him. Like they, they don't succumb to stereotypes. Um, but a lot of the time he's not treated well. It's just a known thing throughout that you learn throughout the series that witchers are just for the most part looked down upon. And a lot of this comes from that monstrum that turned the public against witchers, that made them seem bad. And I don't know that we're to understand that the cats and their crimes is what influenced the monstrum. Uh, They might not have even come around until after that was published. But what they're doing certainly doesn't help improve witchers' reputations. So... It's not really going to bode well for people like Geralt and, you know, the other good guys like Vesemir um, that aren't actually doing bad things to people or torturing or killing people or doing anything bad to innocent people um, when there are other witchers out there that are just making their reputation seem so much worse or at least feeding into like what that monstrum, like that, that idea, that mindset that people have developed from the monstrum. But anyway back to the chapter now that bran is gone and the tensions have calmed down Geralt invites the woman who gave him his swords to join him and she introduces herself as tiziana frevy and tiziana explains how she came across the swords uh, she says that she was meant to deliver them in secret and i knew it i think i even called this out in an episode um like before i read this chapter Back when I first learned that Yen bought the swords at the auction and she was going to have someone else deliver them to Girl, I knew that she was going to want them delivered without her name attached to the deed. I knew it. It just seems like such a Yennefer thing to do. Like she's going to help Carol out, but she doesn't want him to know that she's helping him out behind the scenes. So uh, I don't know. I'm just, I remember reading that and getting pretty excited. But anyway, the cat is out of the bag. Uh, Tiziana had to give Geralt his swords. Um, she says that she's got to come clean now since she wasn't able to deliver them to him without him seeing her. So she goes on to explain that she received them from Yen two weeks ago in Novigrad. And she 
she never does explain how Yen had them. Perhaps um, she didn't know that detail, but Geralt may have been able to figure out that she bought them at the auction because she said that she met Yen two weeks ago in Novigrad, that auction was in Novigrad, probably just a little over two weeks prior. And he knew that they were going to be sold there. Um, but she says that she met Yen at a Master Sorceress's where she was finishing finishing an apprenticeship and ha Yen had her deliver the swords when she learned that Tiziana would be heading south. And the apprenticeship completion and the traveling have to do with her role as a... Uh, I don't think I'm going to say this word right. I think that it has... Just looking at it, I think it's supposed to have a certain type of pronunciation that is not what it looks like, but I'm just going to go with the phonetic pronunciation. It's a uh, Dwimviandra. So this is the type of sorceress that uh, Tiziana is. Um, they're described as a type of sorceress who uh, is fresh out of their magic school, like Aratuza, but they don't stay there as an assistant, and they do not become a permanent apprentice uh, like like Mosaic did, for example, but they frequently take on work from various masters for several years until they're ready to return to take the final exam to become a master themselves. And from what Geralt's heard, they apparently earn a lot of money. It's not really integral to the story, but interesting. So Geralt finally has his swords back, and that's great. This is something he lost at the beginning of the book. He's been going through so much hell to try to get them back. Uh, and he knows that Yen was the one who got them returned to him, which causes him to feel a bit taken aback, not surprisingly. Uh, but he doesn't really linger on that feeling too long. He kind of moves on really fast. Uh, we're getting there. Uh, because Geralt and Tiziana, they sit there and they drink and they hang out. And Dandelion joins them for a little bit. And um, Dandelion asks Geralt, actually, when the three of them are sitting there talking, if he knew about the reward that Bran kept talking about. And Geralt, of course, has not heard of it, but Tiziana has. So she fills them in on what she's heard. She says that King Foltest of Temeria has offered a reward to remove a spell from his daughter. And there's several rumors about what the spell was, but the only one she says is the least likely to be true is that the princess was turned into a striga and as a result of, um, or it was the result of incest. She was cursed because Foltest and his sister had the baby together. And uh, also that that rumor, that she thinks it's the false rumor, we know it's not, uh, but she says that that rumor was probably created by King Vizimir of Redania, who has uh, reoccurring border disputes with Foltest. And we've actually seen examples of that earlier in this book. So this is the true rumor. It's the first chapter of the first book, The Last Wish. Geralt meets with Foltest and he removes the curse from his Striga incest daughter. So I just, I love that. I love how it comes right back around in the timeline. Like the events of the most recently released book and soon before the events of the first book. That's really cool. Uh, but something else that this got me thinking about was how in... The story, titled The Witcher, the one where Geralt lifts the Strega curse, he learns when he's asking questions about it before he goes on to remove the curse, uh, he learns that other witchers had shown up to do the job. I wonder if one of them was Bran. Uh, at least one of those witchers, I remember in the story, um, at least one of them, maybe a few of them, bailed on the job out of fear. And one of them was killed on the job. Maybe there was two of them that was killed. I can't remember. I think it was at least one. I know that much. Uh, but considering what we learn about Bran, I wouldn't feel bad to learn he was the witcher that got killed. I mean, it, I don't know that Subkowski wrote this chapter and wrote about Bran going to Vizima for the reward offered by Foltest. Um with the intention of him having been one of those witchers that did show up that, um, I think the guy's name is Velrad, that Ger Velrad, who Geralt was talking to about the job. Um, I don't know if that was his intention, but in my own head, it was. <laughs> I like to think that it comes full circle. It probably was his intention for all we know, but still, it's pretty, it's fun to think of it that way. And it's, I, I think it's cool to imagine him being the one that got killed because he sucks. He's bad guy 
So Geralt makes it clear to, um, or I'm sorry, Geralt makes it clear to to Ziana and Dandelion that Bran was mistaken. He has no intention of claiming the reward as he doesn't want to get involved in anything political. And that's not surprising after what he just experienced in Karak, all that stuff. He is tired. He's very weary of that. Um, plus, now that he's got his swords back, he doesn't need to use the money that he earned from Risberg to pay for new ones. So he said he can just keep that money to live off of. Well, he thinks he said. That is, until the man Tiziana was previously sitting with approaches Geralt and delivers a court summons. Risberg is suing him for the return plus interest of the money he was given by them, and the date on the summons had already passed, so Geralt surmises that the case has already been heard and they've already seized his account. I know I'm biased, but I truly believe Geralt earned that money. He went through way more than was asked or expected of him to do that job. But they don't see it that way. The people that gave him the money, one of them's dead, the other one's in Nilfgaard. The rest of the people are just spiteful and petty. So this was an infuriating discovery. But it is what it is. So Geralt, Dandelion, and Tiziana hang out in the tavern for the rest of the night. And then Geralt does what Geralt does best. And he joins Tiziana in her room. And then he awakens in the morning to find her gone. So the next section of the chapter cuts to Geralt and Dandelion in some ancient ruins where Geralt finds himself pondering over his recent decisions and actions. And he says that everything that could have gone wrong has and he's messed everything up. And Dandelion doesn't want to hear about it. It's it's a funny response <laughs> since Dandelion's always pressing topics with Geralt that he doesn't want to talk about. But when Geralt's having this earnest moment, he can't be bothered to listen. Uh, I think Dandelion has expressed in the past that he, he doesn't like Geralt in that sort of state. But still, it's just funny. But anyway, Geralt turns around and he sees the Aguara. She says she told him she'd returned and today is that day. But she's unsure why she came herself. And then she says, perhaps to let her say goodbye. And the her she's referring to is her daughter. The one who was on the boat. The one who everybody believed had been killed. And she's there. And she emerges from behind the Aguara. And Geralt is totally astonished by this. Since it should be impossible for her to have been brought back to life. But then realizes that she only pretended to be dead when she was on the boat. Then the Aguara says that her kind once had great powers, but as the world has changed, their abilities dwindled. But even the young ones are still capable of deceiving humans with an illusion. And Geralt's happy about this. He says that he's happy he's been tricked. Because not having been able to protect this child or the way he handled that situation in general was probably one of the things that was weighing on his mind. And then the Aguara tells Geralt that Illusions are what you fear and what you dream of. Then she metamorphoses into Yennefer. The dead tree suddenly blooms with flowers and the petals begin to whirl all around and he hears her say, everything is illusion. And then Geralt returns to Dandelion, who starts complaining to Geralt that he never compliments him on his music or asks to hear songs again, which turns into Dandelion singing one of his songs, and then they decide that they were on their way. Dandelion asks where they're going. Geralt asks, isn't it all the same? And Dandelion agrees, yeah, it is. <laughs> and that's where the chapter ends. And I wonder where their intended destination was. So I've got a little bit of a rant to go on here. We know Geralt goes to Vizima shortly after this. But he likely, I say likely because it's not definite, but he likely goes to Sintra first. And that's when the A Question of Price story plays out. So in between the end of Season of Storms and the Witcher story, like the first story titled The Witcher, where he lifts the Striga curse. And the reason that I believe this and it's not even a big deal. Like, I don't think Sibkowski really even cared that much to establish a timeline. Um, 
when it comes to these things, at least like the main story, like from blood of elves to lady of the lake, like that timeline is important and you, you know where you are. But, um, when it comes to this stuff, I don't think he was that concerned with it, but as a very big fan of these books, uh, I like to get really pedantic, but the reason I believe that a question of price comes between season of storms and the witcher is because when you put together the time of year plus Pavetta's nine month pregnancy with Siri and Geralt mentioning in one of the voice of reason sections in the last wish that his child surprise, the child would have been born in May. We can assume that he went to Sintra and invoked the law of surprise before he went to full test because this is like, August here. So Siri would have been conceived in about August if she was born in May. And that's that math is definitely correct. Yeah. Right? August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. Yeah. And then he um when by the time she knew she was pregnant, it had to have been at least like six weeks after she was conceived. So you don't sh start showing pregnancy symptoms usually until about six weeks after conception. So <laughs> um, the reason I say it is likely is because Geralt says to Eola in one of the Voice of Reason sections that the child would have been born in May. He may have not meant May of that year, but that is how I interpreted it. Even before reading Season of Storms and trying to gather this timeline in my brain, I thought that he meant, oh, the child would have been born in May, like would have just been born this past May. And uh, and he was at the temple, the Melitale temple, talking to Yola and uh, Mother Nenica right after the Witcher first story because he was there recovering from the wound he received from the girl after she um, was transitioning out of her Striga curse, but still hadn't fully transitioned because she had her talons and she cut Geralt's neck. So anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that that's what was going on. It really doesn't even matter. It's like Geralt said, isn't it all the same? It's all the same. Everything still plays out the way it does. It doesn't make a difference if you figure out a timeline, but I, I got so caught up when I was writing out the notes for this episode and trying to establish the timeline because I considered those details from the last wish, like the voice of reason and the first story. And then I just, I, I don't know. I really wanted to get to the bottom of it <laughs> just for fun. And, uh, yeah, it, you can't really 100% say the, 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 the question of price story came after this, but it probably did may not, but probably did. Anyway, we're moving on now. I knew I was going to rant long on that. <laughs> At least you uh, aren't actually inside my brain and didn't get to hear that when I was trying to map this out, when I was writing out these notes. My goodness. Okay, the epilogue. Let's talk about the epilogue now, shall we? It returns us to Nimue, who is traveling to Eratusa to begin learning sorcery. And she's about to enter a forest, and she's feeling very anxious about it, but she's got to move through it to get to where she's going. And the highway through the forest is totally deserted, which worries her more because she's alone. If somebody wanted to harm her, they could do so, no problem. And she has the right to be worried, considering she was in danger, as a monster springs out of the brush and goes to attack her. But she's saved by a man with two swords and white hair. He kills the monster, and then she sees him cut something off of its corpse. Then he checks on her. Monster's dead. He goes to check on her and make sure she's good, which she is as far as the attack goes, but she's in total shock from what she's looking at. And then he goes to read the metal plate that was that he cut off of the monster because it's got writing on it. And it says the same thing that the um, plate from the eater that Geralt killed in chapter one had, except it's a different number. It's like a weird combination of letters and numbers. And he says, oh, this one was missing from my collection. So, yeah, there's another eater, just like what Geralt fought at the beginning. Um, the plate on it was like the one that he discussed with the mages in Risberg. And he said that there, oh, there must be others wandering about the world, killing innocent people. So, okay, instead of dancing around it, <laughs> I'm just going to say this man is supposed to be Geralt. 
But whether or not this really happened, we don't know. It's open to interpretation. But if this moment really happened, then we can see that Geralt came back from the land Siri brought him and Yennefer to when they got killed and or when he got killed in um, Rivia. And he continued his quest to kill the Eaters. But we, we're going to talk more about that. Trust me, we will talk more about that shortly. I want to go back to where we're at in the epilogue. So the man that we're just going to call Geralt, whether this is real or not, he asks Nimue where she's going. And she tells him Aratuza and she tells him where she came from. And she um, thanks him for saving her. And he says, oh, well, I actually owe you thanks because... I've been trying to hunt this monster for days, but it hasn't come out until now because it's been waiting for easy prey like you. So then she sees his horse and she says, wait, this is your horse. Your horse's name is Roach, since that's what you call all of your horses because you're the witcher, Geralt of Rivia. And to this, he replies by asking (laughs) what year it is. And she tells him the year, which makes him calculate that Geralt has been dead for 105 years, but... He would be happy if he knew that after all this time, people still remembered him. So he's kind of like saying, I'm not Geralt, by referring to Geralt from a third person point of view. Um, But Nimue, as a huge fan of the legend, doesn't want to believe that Geralt's dead. She says, well, Geralt didn't die. He only went away to the land of apple trees, but he'll return to protect people from evil. And since evil still exists, witchers are necessary. So he's got to return. And to this, he says, yeah, evil will always exist. Darkness will always exist. And witchers will always be necessary. And may they appear with sword in hand. And then he says, a sword whose gleam will penetrate the darkness. A sword whose brightness disperses the gloom. Just like the runes on Geralt's silver sword that I talked about earlier. I said we'd come back to it. Here we are coming back to it. Um, Which this could be evidence that this is really Geralt returned. Or that Nimue did dream this. And as a dedicated fan of the legend was already familiar with the runes on his blade. Um, And that's why her mind thought that. But he tells her they're going to part now, but she says that she wants to know more about Yennefer and Ciri. Ciri's first mention in this book. Makes sense that she wouldn't come up a lot, but I I just wanted to point that out. I like that Ciri's name is in this book at all. And she wants to know how the story really ends. But he cuts her off to tell her that the road to her destiny is before her. You, You gotta go. You gotta follow your destiny. Um, and you can say that her destiny is to help Siri, since in the future she does exactly that, like we learned toward the end of Lady of the Lake. And then he says, the story goes on. The tale never ends. And I, I'll be honest, I'm not totally sure how to interpret that. But from my understanding, some people believe that that's Subkowski addressing the readers. But who knows for sure. And then he tells her that there's one witcher sign she doesn't know called the Some. And he tells her to look at his hand, which she does. And she hears someone say, everything is illusion. Just like the Aguara said. So another way you may interpret this is that the Aguara cast an illusion. Like this illusion was... um, Nimue thinking that she saw Geralt and it would fit for someone like her who was so fascinated by the legend, a legend that she dedicated pretty much most of her life to. Uh, but I, it's a, we just don't know for sure. And also, the Aguara told Geralt that illusions are what you fear and what you dream of. And at the end of the epilogue, Nimue says she had a very strange dream. So maybe that's what's going on. We'll never know for sure. And then she's suddenly waking up in the forest on the side of the highway by a traveling woman on a wagon. And Nimi begins looking around when she wakes up and the woman asks what she's looking for. And she says she's looking for a man with white hair. But the woman says she didn't see anyone. I mean, if Geralt really was there, he could have made off before this woman showed up. But the traveler invites Nimi to ride with her to Dorian on her wagon. And Nimi takes her up on her offer. She says to Nimue, you must have been pretty tired to fall asleep on the side of the road. And Nimue agrees, saying she had a very strange dream. 
And that's the last line of the epilogue. But right before that, there's a moment where she's on the wagon and she's, they're moving. She's looking back at the forest and then she's looking ahead at the road, a road towards destiny. So she's looking ahead to her future, to what she's destined to do. Similarly, it's mentioned with Siri at the very end of Lady of the Lake when she's riding off with Galahad. Uh, she, behind them was like the lake and whatever else. And in front of them was everything. So this is a nice touch. But anyway, did Nimue dream this? Was it an illusion cast by the Aguara? Was Geralt really there? Okay, closing thoughts. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. There were times where I felt like it was a little bit disjointed with all the side plots, but really, all the side plots were connected to the main plot, so when you think about it, it wasn't really disjointed. It did feel that way a little bit. Um, sometimes these side plots and the way they were connected was very subtle. Uh, sometimes it was obvious. Um, like, a lot of what Geralt got caught up in was a result of the main plot, like the losing and needing to recover his swords. Um, although I guess like going to Risberg and the Daggerland fiasco wasn't necessarily tied to the sword thing, uh, but that was the only exception. And they did tie that into the um, King Bellahoon assassination, and Geralt was present for that because of his sword. So in a way, um, kind of, sort of, is tied to the plot. Uh, but either way, I found all of those plots to be fun, exciting, dark suspenseful, like just chock full of entertainment that made me not want to put the book down. Um, so that's a good book right there. And sometimes prequels, they can be felt as uh, a cheap way for the author to earn extra money just by selling people on another book that doesn't really add any value to the overall series. But I didn't feel this way at all reading Season of Storms. I don't know if that's the opinion of some people with this. I'm just saying that um, even though that that may happen with some authors in some book series, I didn't feel like that's what was going on here. I felt very appreciative that I got to see Geralt and uh, like this, he's this character that I love. I got to see him again, like read about him again, more of his adventures. And I got to know him a little bit better, his past. I got to know a little bit better. So that was really great. But speaking on this chapter, chapter 20 specifically, I was pleased to see him get his swords back and learned that Yennefer was the one who got them for him because I was very sure he'd get those swords back, but I didn't know if Yennefer was, or if he was going to know that Yennefer was the one that helped him. And that would have kind of annoyed me, I think, <laughs> if he didn't learn that. So that was pleasing. And Bran in this chapter was an interesting villain. He added excitement to the final chapter, and I'm glad we got to see the Aguara come back and see that her daughter wasn't harmed because it was so disturbing to think of her getting killed the way we were originally led to believe, especially with all the other dark things that take place, like all of the deaths by Daggerland and all the people that died in that storm. Um, at least one person who we thought died in a messed up way actually didn't. And the epilogue, I thought was pretty neat. I mean, although we don't know exactly what went on there, it's still cool to see how Nimue um, talked about the legend because it shows that even at this young age, she was very passionate about it. And I know that she was learning about it when she was a small child through that man that would come to her village and tell the story to all the kids. But it's just cool to see how much it means to her before she even saw Siri for the first time when she was older, older than she is now, but younger than she was in like the main parts of Lady of the Lake when we are present with her. And I can relate <laughs> to her passion for this story. So I think that's why I like her passion so much. I think that's why it speaks to me, I guess you could say. Okay. Hmm. That is all I have for you. I can't go into my looking ahead section because there's nothing to look ahead to. This is it. Unless Sapkowski writes another Witcher book. Oh, I hope he does. I've read people online saying that he has said that he's not going to do it. But then I also read something not that long ago that says that he was going to work on another uh, Witcher story. Who knows at this point? I mean, at least at the time of this being recorded. 
I don't know, but I really hope so. I'd be very happy to get to read more about at least this world. If he doesn't make another story about Geralt, I would be excited to even just read anything else about this world. But we'll have to see. Okay, well, I thank you so much for being here, for listening, for engaging. Uh, this has been so, so great. And uh, I could cry. So I think I'm just going to end this before I do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just to let you know, in case you didn't, these episodes are available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcast. Thank you so much for joining. And I hope that I catch you in the future when I continue the series with another book. Bye.